Hi guys, it's Steph from iDriver Classic. Now today I'm back. In our last video, we went out in a different Volvo. We went out in a 164, which was owned by Steve. Now Steve has a wonderful fiance named Jess, and I found out that Jess was not only also driving a classic Volvo, but she's driving it daily. And I asked what it was, and I got sent back a picture of this superb Volvo 340. And it's given me a bit of a complex because honestly, for a daily, it looks insane. So you're gonna notice a few things as we look around the car, and there's a lot going on. So just remember, if you see little bits and pieces, like the baby seat and stuff, just remember and be kind because this is somebody's daily car. And not just anybody, it's a young girl daily it as a mum. And it's incredible because it's the next generation of classic cars. Anyway, let's start the video. We're gonna go for a walk around the outside of the car, hop in the inside, we're gonna have a look around the inside, have a look at the dash, have a look under the bonnet and everything in between. And then we're gonna go out for a drive and hopefully we'll get a chat with Jess as well because it's pretty exceptional, I think, to see a young woman, especially a young woman with a very young baby. So um, Steve and Jess's baby isn't even a year old yet. Also he's called Jacob, which has Volvo connections. Anyway, we'll come back to that later. So without delay, let's go and have a look around the car and start the video on this amazing Volvo 340. First of all, guys, I've got to apologise. I've got a bit of a Christmas cold, so I sound a little bit groggy, but don't worry. Hopefully, it will have cleared by the next video. So today, as I've already mentioned, we are looking at the Volvo 340, which for the Volvo diehards of you, and I didn't know how many there were until I did the 164 video, this sits within the 300 series, and it's a little bit more advanced than the 164 we took out, which you'll see both on the inside and on the out. And we've also got some exciting cross over info. So where did the Volvo 340 begin? Well first of all let's talk about that crossover info and I'm going to bring you into the mad world of DAF. Now you may know them as being truck makers or you may know them as Leyland DAF but way back when they made cars too such as in fact a car that I once went to view myself the DAF 44 which runs on variomatic um, transmission. Now the point of DAF being mentioned is this. So after bringing to market a series of attractive compact cars in the 1960s, DAF designed a car which they were intending to launch as the DAF 77 in 1970. However, they needed a bit of investment and they needed the buy-in from a big manufacturer, really to make it possible on the scale that they wanted to make it. So they approached several manufacturers, including Audi, BMW and Volvo. And whilst initially hesitant in that sensible Volvo way, they saw the potential of the tie-in because DAF had access to the Renault engine which they saw as a fantastic opportunity and it meant that they could expand their model lineup without massive time and investment to do so because when you think about the work involved in creating an engine testing it and all the rest of it an opportunity like this just is such a great thing for a manufacturer like Volvo and plus talking about the economic side of things Volvo being a Swedish brand it didn't have access to the European trade market whereas DAF resided in the Netherlands and therefore did which meant that Volvo were able to kind of tap the market up a lot better and increase their market share with a lot more ease than perhaps if they just you know had that base in Sweden so what they did was is Volvo went in and they purchased a one-third share and with that the 300 series was born from the plan of the DAF 77 now whereas DAF had planned to run the new car they'd created with the usual variomatic transmission that they'd used elsewhere Volvo stepped in like the sense bladder at wild party and said actually let's do something a little bit more conventional which you would expect from volvo and they launched the 300 series with the peugeot 1.4 and 1.7 engines and then for the 360 they offered the two litre volvo engine so the 300 series started life as two offerings you could have had the three door 343 or the five door 345 and the range the 300 range expanded in 1984 to include the humble but now fast growing in popularity and cult young retro driver status the volvo 340 as we have here today now whilst Jeremy Clarkson wasn't the biggest fan of the 340 it seems like his hatred wasn't really shared by the buying public because by 1988 the year I was born uh, the 300 series had sold over 1 million units which is an incredible feat and in the UK it regularly hit the top 20 best-selling cars and again was topping the import list sitting at kind of number one number two especially in the early 1980s and was a firm favorite as not only a car in its own right but 
for the growing market of the middle classes going for second car, which interestingly is now this car's purpose in 2019. It's the family's second car. So despite a strong appreciation for the buying public, the 300 series isn't every Volvo enthusiast favourite, which I'm sure you guys are going to step in and tell me um, on the video because you always love to leave comments. But for now, I think it's high time we caught up with just the owner of this car and found out why she's picked a Volvo as her everyday car. Okay, um, I've got a Volvo 340. Um, it's great to daily because it's really sturdy. I like it because I've got a four-month-old baby and I just feel like it's a really safe car to drive. Um, obviously, if I had the same budget and was to buy a modern car, I wouldn't be able to get something that's as good quality um, as the Volvo. As I'm sure you've all seen anyway, Jacob, um, the form of our baby, my baby, um, has been named after the vo first Volvo OV4, Stephen's idea, more than mine, really. Um, but we still like it. Um, he actually met the OV4 at the NEC a couple of months ago, which was really nice. Um, a lot of people ask me what it's like to be a girl and drive a, an older car. Um, I do find that a lot of people assume that it's Stephen's car, especially at shows, which, to be fair, I don't mind to some extent because I can't really answer a lot of the technical, mechanical um, questions. He tends to do that sort of side of it and I clean them. <laughs> um, but it, it would be nice if people sort of did acknowledge that I was in the same vicinity when they start talking to Stephen about my car. Um, and would you recommend a Volvo to somebody else? Yes, yeah, I would definitely uh, recommend it, especially if you was a girl and you didn't, you know, you don't know much about cars. It's it never really breaks down. I know people that have got modern cars and their car breaks down more than mine. Um, it's really reliable and it's easy to drive. It's got a lot of the mod cons that a modern car would have anyway, so that's why I get on with it really well. Now, when we took out the Volvo 164, you'll remember we were surrounded by 70s decadence of fake wood and vinyl. And if you haven't watched that video yet, you definitely should. Um, and there was a lot going on which screamed 70s. Now, we're at this point, we're in kind of the mid to late 80s and everything has massively changed. And it's something we saw across a lot of manufacturers, but in particular, it feels like there's been a huge jump that we don't necessarily see nowadays in modern cars. This was the era when cars were changing at breakneck speed. So as we look inside today, we're gonna see a lot of plastic. So gone is the funky, you know, the funky mustard colored, trim on the doors with the gratuitous use of chrome we're now into the 80s so it's fully functional plastic it's molded plastic we've seen technology jump so that making things up molded plastic isn't the expense it once was and it is something they can put into use for cars quite easily and we're starting to move into that era at this point to give you a bit of socio-economic update to where this car fits we're moving into that era where cars were more affordable buying a car wasn't such an occasion and you may not keep it as long so the overall cost of making cars came down and also as well this wasn't quite where you would have had you know it wasn't where the 164 was right at the top of the range this was more kind of middle of the road but we'll talk about that when we go for a drive so looking around the inside you'll notice that we've got a lot of the molded plastic but we're still harking back to that era that you don't tend to see in modern cars anymore where you've got this beautiful tweed finish on these seats which are incredible nick for the age of the car the fact it's used so frequently so you see that trimmed through the doors with the molded plastic over here you've got your glove box so we'll slide that across you've got your lit glove box over there and then we're starting to get into that era of you know very full-on controls you've got your heaters up here you've got all your heater controls here so we've gone from in the 70s volvo for having just two it's either you know on or kind of on uh, all the way through to things like heated seats so we've got heated seats in this car not something i'm able to demonstrate but i can assure you it was a bit of a weird experience because i wasn't expecting it and i was like oh uh, what's What's going on with that seat? So yeah, so heated seats. I mean, heated seats. British Leyland, where were you? Why did we not have heated seats? So 
I'm coming back to the dash over here. So it's had a little bit of a facelift, which uh, Steve and Jess have done, which is done correctly for kind of the era of the car. But this used to be a blanking plate. It's now a clock. And where the clock was over here is now a rev count. So there's a few different things going on and you've got an awful lot going on again. So you've got the clock over here. You've got what is now a coin tray, but because you wouldn't be smoking with a baby in the car. I don't think you would even, well, to be fair, people did do it in the 80s. Um, again, you've got your cigarette, um, cigarette lighter over here, updated stereo. So, you know, this car's being driven on the regular. It's got Bluetooth connection. For all you people that buy new cars because you've got Bluetooth connection, you could just retrofit it in an older car. It's not that difficult. Now, we're stepping away from the auto gearbox that we had in the last car. We're back onto manual. And again, so just your normal handbrake is where you expect it to be for a car. And you've got your steering wheel. Again, pretty normal. You have got your twin horn there, so look. Mm -hmm. So you've got two horn buttons. It's a bit, it's a bit over the top, isn't it? Um, Okay, so you've got all your controls over here, but we're walking into a world of a lot more warning lights. So you've got things like your hazard warning lights, you've got your handbrake, you've got your battery, you've got your oil, you've got your brakes, you've got a seatbelt warning light, uh, which actually I do have in the Metro, but they discontinued after a year because look, it's a Metro and they just thought it's not a safe car anyway. Um, you've got things like your choke warning light, you've got your you've got your hazards, you've got your phone, you've got everything going on in here that you could possibly want. And also, something that isn't in every 80s car that I've tested, you've got a light on the dash to tell you that your headlights are on. Now, it may seem something so simple, but when you get out of your car and you're in a rush, if you just quit, quickly look down the dash and you notice you've got your lights on you can save yourself a world of untold heartache of flat batteries or more embarrassingly one of the neighbors knocking on the door and telling you the lights are on which is quite a common occurrence for me um and so yeah so everything's kind of as you would expect it to be it's quite similar to a lot of other 80s cars but yeah at the face of it it's it's looking great it's you know it's great quality it's all it all feels quite sturdy and uh, i think it's high time that we started the car up and now uh, hope what it sounds like now we're going to start the car up, but there was one last thing that I forgot to tell you. So as you know, Volvos were the pioneers of safety. The seatbelt, for example, they could have painted it that. They could have made millions, but they removed the paint because they wanted to be known as the guardians and the champions of automotive safety. And it doesn't just stop at seatbelts. And I think that's so important to discuss. So not only are these cars built to a superior standard, there's little things going on that you may not know. So. Steve's told me this so because he's a Volvo nut he was definitely the best person to team up with to bring Volvo to our driver classic for the first time so you see these two vents up here now I thought they were going to be uh, heated vents but actually they only blow cold air the reason for that is is because the engineers at Volvo said if you as the driver so you can tilt them back over to yourself and you have some blowing hot air in your face on a long journey you're likely to become drowsy now I think that's quite interesting and again it shows that they took safety not only you know their belt and braces stuff that you think you know we need some warning lights we need some seat belts they took it that one step further and really thought about the driving experience and thought about where the pitfalls were in that kind of that safety world so yeah I'm really impressed so far now it's time for me to start the car now, for those of you that are a bit eagle-eyed, you may have spotted under the bonnet, we don't have a Volvo engine, it's actually a Renault engine. But we'll talk about that when we go for a drive. Most important thing is, we need to hear what it sounds like. So, we give it a bit of... Honestly, the weather is rubbish today. Even I didn't want to wake up, let alone these poor cars. So we'll give it a bit of gas, we'll try again. So, there we go. I think, you know, if you're watching from outside of the UK, the weather at the moment is dreadful. It's so cold, it's so damp, and sometimes it can really put a dampener on, not, not any pun intended, really put a dampener on these cars starting up. It can make things a little bit testy. So now that we've got it going, I think it's high time that I belt it up in true Volvo fashion, and we headed out to the road to see what she's really like. So, it's a bit bizarre to be out on something like this really, because uh, it feels like a massive step forward and actually it's only a few years newer than the metro that I drive every day, so it feels kind of quite fast and again the steering, just like the Volvo that we had before we took out, the steering feels very precise, so you really feel like you have full control of the car. Now I don't know if that's a Volvo characteristic or I've been spoiled with two fabulous examples of these cars, but Honestly, it's, it's just incredible to drive. It's so smooth as well, and it's really quiet. So, I guess, because you know, we've done the 164, and now we're taking out the 340, 
So we've got things like hazard lights, we've got things like, you know, your enhanced safety features, you've got, it's very warm as well, it's not something that I can convey across the video for you, but it's a very warm car as well, which is great because when you are driving to work in the cold or you've got young sun in the back, you don't want a car that's freezing, it's not fun. You know, some of your older 60s and 70s stuff can be very cold and in fact some of the 80s stuff can be quite cold and feel quite a chore as well on a cold day. Whereas I feel like with this, I mean, we're going along the road, it's a bit bumpy, it's a bit, you know, it's not the best, it hasn't been resurfaced in a while and yet the car is gliding smoothly across it and I'm quite impressed. So where did this sit? So, um, it was a competitor for your middle market, middle middle of the road driver. So it was someone who was maybe looking at an Astro, maybe someone who was looking at a Ford Escort. They were chasing that particular market. And I guess it was maybe the same sort of person who would have also bought a Maestro. So it was a little bit more expensive than, uh, it's a little bit more expensive than British Leyland. But when you buy a car, it's not always about the price tag. So the price tag obviously plays, plays a significant part in what you're doing in your decision making process. But at the same time, you also have to think about things like what's it like to drive? What's it like on the handling? What's it like, you know, in terms of all round comfort for day to day driving? And I'm very lucky in that I took out the Astra earlier this year. And I would say, in some ways, they're comparable. And in some ways I prefer this, and in some ways I prefer the Astra. So I preferred the styling of the Astra, um, but in terms of the comfort as I sit in these seats, I much prefer the Volvo. So the seats in this feel slightly wider. They almost hug your back, which I think on a long journey, you know, I'm trying to think objectively, what would I want on a long journey, just not on a test drive. You want those seats that are comfortable. You want a car that is gonna offer you you know, you're not going to need, you're not going to be keeping an osteopath in work for months after you've got out of one long drive. This feels like a car that you could do, you know, great swathes of the motorway and not have to worry too much, which is largely helped as well by that 1.7 engine under the bonnet, but also as well with the gearbox. So the gearbox has struck me. So we're looking at 55k on the clock. So it's not, you know, for a car of this age where, you know, at one point in time it would have been quite a budget buy, um, it's not been thrashed, it's not huge on the mileometer, but at the same time it's no spring chicken either, it's not a rare concourse 10k example, so the gearbox has been used, you know, it's a commuter car, it's been used in traffic, and yet it still feels so smooth, and it's one of those gearboxes as well where for those of you that drive a manual, you know what I mean. You know some gearboxes just feel a bit laborious when you're trying to find a gear. This feels like the gear pattern is very... Um, I knew exactly where the gears were before I'd even started looking for them. It's Essentially, it's a very easy car to drive. And I think if you were looking for your first classic, I would say have a think about the 340 because it's still quite cheap to buy, so you can still get a fantastic example for under £1,500. The insurance isn't crippling, you're not going to have to put a black box in it, but at the same time, it's as close to the modern car as you need without it being boring. And I think sometimes that is the danger of classic, you know, some modern cars are a bit boring or some modern classics can feel a bit boring. Like, sorry to say it, but the Rover 75, you know, modern classic, but for me, doesn't take that excitement factor whereas this you can really put your foot down and you can have a laugh in it it's still quirky you're going to look across the car park you're going to spot it the first time but you're not having to make massive compromises like you are with some classics i mean you know some of your 60s some of your 70s stuff in fact doesn't have things that has warning lights you don't have headrests you may not have seat belts whereas with this you've got your seat belts um all the way around you've got you know, you've got enhanced visibility because it's not cut off with all these massive pillars like you get in these modern cars. And all round, it's quite a pleasurable driving experience for a classic car. And um, it's really, really shocked me how much I've enjoyed it. It's, it's, look, I'm, you know, I'm coasting along, it's great. And I guess one of the other things that I would point out is that, and it might seem very small to somebody else, um, but it's quite a big deal for me, is that, 
with a classic, one of the most painful bits of commuting, if you're in an older car with no synchro mesh on first gear, is that you constantly have to come to a complete stop to go into first gear. Whereas with this, because you've got your synchro on your first, you can just go into, you know, just go into first as you're rolling. And again, just another very small point that helps make it a very viable daily classic car. Now, you do have a Volvo Owners Club. As you've probably seen, we've got Steve, we've had Steve in the video, Steve's fiance, Jessica, she's quite young. There are other young people. It's not an old Krusty's Club. There are other young people that you can speak to. So yeah, it's, uh, for me, it's not just about what this car's like to drive, but I think it's also quite a valid point to talk about what it is as a, as a modern classic and a, a viable classic too. That's back to my favourite position in the filming in the front because it's much easier to talk to you guys when I'm looking straight at you and kind of you're off to the side. So I guess it's a bit of a funny one for me because I came to this video today, I came to Wells. Again, we've had to a bit of a top-up video on this. But the first time I came to see this car, I had no preconceived ideas about what it would be like or what Volvo was like as a manufacturer, other than that I knew that they were very safe because, you know, they created the seatbelt and you know that they're famous for being safety, they're famous for reliability. Um, and this car has really impressed me. I didn't, I didn't know what to expect, but I thought, look, it's a car that's under a grand and a half, so I expected it to be thoroughly average. But it's the little things that have impressed me about it. So it's things like, and I know this might seem silly to other people, but for me, it's something that I pick up when you take out cars. There's no knocks, there's no rattles. The bodywork is beautiful. Like it's in such exceptional condition for the, you know, for what it costs and for, because it was under a grand and a half, so it's what it costs. And also, you know, the fact that it's driven every day as well. So it, I just think it's, for me, the things that make it impressive, because you may look at it and be like, look, it's an 80s car, especially some of you guys are a little bit older. You sometimes say when I put up an 80s car, you say, oh, well, it's it's an 80s car and it's not a classic. But look, 1980 was 40 years ago. It, these cars are the classics of the future. We're going to have to accept they are classics soon rather than later. Stuff in the 90s now is classic. So I think what stands out for me and makes this a memorable classic, it feels a bit too new for me, if I'm honest, but what makes it stand out for me and what makes me say to you guys at home that I would recommend it are the following. It's very easy to drive. It's very responsive and it hugs the road. It's great on handling. So that's a big point for me because, you know, you don't want to be especially as maybe a new driver or a younger driver driving your first classic, you don't want to scare yourself by driving something ludicrous that's all over the road. Um, it's quiet, which is great because when you're driving and if you're driving large distances on a long commute, you're going to be wanting something that's not going to deafen you because I'm partially deaf now because I drove a Morris Minor for years with a stainless steel exhaust. Funny at the time, but nowadays completely impractical, um, although I do still enjoy it. Um, so we've got the handling, we've got the quiet, you know, how quiet the car is. As you felt there when we went over a monumental size speed bump, the suspension is good as well. You're not, you're not like clattering around. You're not going to be keeping an osteopath in work for months. You know, it's quite a pleasurable drive. The heated seats really help. You get all these people that say, oh, in fact, I had a comment the other day that said, you know, oh, I like my heated seats. I like, um, I like all the mod cons in my car. But actually, this has quite a few of them anyway. Um, you know, the retrofitted stereo offers you Bluetooth. So you've got Bluetooth, you've got heated seats, you've got hazard warning lights, you've got seat belts all around. What more do you want? It's again, so you've got your handling, you've got your, you know, you've got handling, you've got your comfort. In terms of all your mod cons, you've got most of the ones here that you actually need. It's cheap to insure, it's cheap to drive, and um, it's a thoroughly pleasurable experience. So it gets, again, it gets a very high mark for me. It doesn't get the full 10 because it feels a bit too new for me. I like stuff that's kind of, most of most of the stuff that I fall in love with is kind of your 50s, 60s stuff. But this is, you know, this is still a fantastic car. I'm just gonna wave to this old Datsun. Hold on. God, it's a Nissan, well, Datsun, Nissan, whatever, Nissan Cherry. Anyway, I'm very wildly off the course. It's time for me to say goodbye to you guys and hand the keys back. So yeah, I would give this a solid eight out of 10. And especially because somebody is using it for commuting as well, it's great. It's someone's daily and it's a beautiful car. So be kind when you're leaving your comments. And uh, I really hope you've enjoyed
enjoyed it and as I said in my last Volvo video so if you haven't caught up already in the last video I said that um, as we come into 2020 now that I've got a job videos will be going back to normal it'll be every Wednesday and every Sunday and I cannot wait to get back into routine with you guys and as always if you've got social media catch up with me on Facebook Twitter Instagram as unimaginatively I drive a classic where I post about my weekly mishaps things that are going on cars that I spot and all the adventures in between but until next time I hope you've uh, I hope you've had a wonderful Christmas and you're settling in nicely ready for a very exciting 2020. Now until next time, take care and drive safely.